So everyone get comfortable. How are you doing tonight? Good. I asked a question, I didn't get an answer. How are you doing tonight? Thank you. So we're going to be doing legal issues in publishing tonight. And I'm going to go down the line with these folks, introduce themselves. They are very, very wonderful writers. And we've got a few lawyers here too. <laughs> but her spirit animal yes. is Hucker Birdman, so we're good there. <laughs> anyway, once they do their intros, I'll do mine and we'll rock this thing. How about that? Y'all ready? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Okay. We can share. We can share. We're grown ups. It's on. Whoa. <laughs> I'm Cage Allen. I'm from Detroit. I write GLBT Lit. I've been doing this now for maybe a little over 10 years. And I'm self publishing a, my first novella. <laughs> in a week and a half or so, which is my first venture into self-publishing and learning that side of things. Other than that, I still work with publishers, currently working with three. Uh, TC Blue, I have been published since, I want to say, 2007. I am currently working with five publishers. Um, I write mostly, to date, in the contemporary gay romance area. Uh, I am currently branching out into some to me, interesting paranormal stuff. So I hope you all will keep an eye out. I'm clumsy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Karen and Kelly. Um, I also write gay romance. I also write some horror. Um, I've got 15 novels out to date and over 80 shorter works in print and ebook through a variety of houses. Okay. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Ah, okay. My name is Stephanie Burke. I am a Newsweek best-selling author. Yay! I've you are USA Today, too, aren't you? Mm -hmm. USA Today. USA Today bestseller, Amazon bestseller. So, yay, we are selling and I love it. Right now, I write romance, erotica, horror, sci-fi, LBGT stories with issues, contemporary a little bit, and I love the new zombie thing. Basically, if I'm going to make money at doing it, I'm going to write it. So, yay, because I like paying bills. Mad respect. <laughs> Book number 77 just dropped two weeks ago, and hopefully in October, book number 78. And I've just signed some new contracts because I just got out of some really bad contracts. We're going to cover that shortly, yeah, too. Yeah. So, let me pass it on. So, I am Meredith Rose. I am not an author, um, I am a lawyer because I am a failed author. Um, <laughs> the closest I've ever gotten is Analog. Is still Analog Sci-Fi Magazine is still sitting on one of my stories for the last five months. So, you know, if anyone knows anyone who works there, punch them. Um, I work for Why Public Knowledge. It? Yeah. I work for Public Knowledge. We're a group that does um, some telecom policy and a lot of intellectual property stuff, especially like creator side, consumer side, so a little bit of everything. My name is TJ Myhill. I write all kinds of things like complaints and answers and motions for summary judgment. I have written a couple of articles and chapters and books, but those don't really count because they're really legal and they're really, really dry. So I do the law, uh, mostly litigation, copyright litigation. And, uh, and when things go bad with your publisher, that's when you call me. And my name is Sasha Levich. I've been writing romance and erotica for the last 16 years. I've pretty much done it all, read it all, written it all. Um, I edit for two different companies as well, and I also am represented by the M. Corvisiero Agency and publicity by Paradigm Warriors. So that's who I am. Let's get this started with you guys. Um, let's go with the obvious first question. What are, when looking at contracts in publishing, what are the red flags? Boilerplate. <sighs> Really? Yeah. Okay. I hate boilerplate contracts because a lot of times, yeah. I'm sorry, boilerplate contracts, a lot of times they're so general and if you don't read them very carefully, you wind up signing your life away. Mm -hmm. In perpetuity. Yes. Because sometimes a publisher will slip that to a contract and somebody will sign it, not understanding that you've just given up rights to this book or your, your, your copyright basically forever. Also, uh, beware of fine print that basically if you sign that contract says that your publisher owns your pen name mm -hmm. there are <coughs> those out there mm -hmm. it does not mean you can't write for another publisher but if you have any degree of success under your pen name with that publisher if they own the rights to your pen name you cannot use it with any other publisher 
So you're starting from scratch every time. Oh. And I wanted to throw contract. in the Red Sage contract itself. I, I signed it because I knew what I was doing with it, but the Red Sage contract, for example, owns that everything about that story. Mm. Mm -hmm. e they even, no, they actually own the rights not yet invented. Mm -hmm. I kid you not. I got you yeah. good. But I, well, they did, but I did it because it was a career move for me as a romance author. Defined who I am was better. But not everyone has that option. Yeah. You also have to look out for contracts that does not cover audio, visual, and foreign rights. Because if you don't, somebody can put your name on something and it can be schlock and send it to another country, translate to another language, and when people read it, they get upset with you, you use readers, <coughs> and you can't really say anything because you didn't cover those rights. Got one. Yeah, you keep hitting that one. Give it a second. <laughs> I just got the rights back to a book I wrote, uh, co-wrote with one of my like, former high school teachers, and it's been on. God, it's been out there for 11, 12 years, I think. We signed the contract. We had a lawyer go over it, an entertainment lawyer signed it. Uh, did not realize that they were going to put on a paperback book about this size. They put a forty-three dollar price tag on it. So, consequently, oh. we did not sell more than a hundred copies of it. <coughs> And we, do not see, we did not see royalties until 1,000 copies were sold, and we never even came close to that. Got it back, and when I was going over the contract about a month ago, trying to find out how we get the rights back, there was nothing stipulating in that contract how we would get the rights back or how they could tell us we, they didn't want us, that they didn't want the book anymore, and they were going to have the rights reverted back. So that didn't get caught 10 years ago. So you want to make sure that you've got an out and they've got an out. So I actually have, uh, just quick, from a legal perspective, um, as, as a not writer, um, <laughs> I preface all of the things I say here implicitly with as a not writer. Um, so one of the neat things actually about US copyright law is that there's a, an automatic rights reversion after 35 years. Um, and this oh, is, wow. and it's, it's, you know, I, I hope everyone has a, a bountiful and long career such that you are still publishing 35 years after your first work, but if you find yourself stuck in that situation, 35 years after it's initially published, you can, without having to renegotiate a contract, reclaim your rights. So. We have the cube, hang on. Wait, yeah, there's a cube and yeah, something's in my eyes. Also, watch out for things that don't Okay, that was not me. Yay. <laughs> that was trippy. Also, watch out for contracts that don't stipulate an end date to the contract. Okay? <laughs> because it might give you really great terms on the face of it, but if it doesn't say this contract is effective for two years or four years or five years or seven years, basically it never ends. And if, you're, if that contract is with a publisher that doesn't promote anything and doesn't sell anything, your best writing could be locked into this contract for eternity. Okay, so this one? Yeah. Okay, so my question is to Meredith. You said after published. What about after contracted? Like if there's a contract and they're sitting on it, if after 35 so, years? So, the way, co like technically, the way copyright only kicks in when the well, copyright kicks in when the work is completed. Now, presumably, and again, someone please correct me if this is if this is wrong. Um, that there's a relatively there's not a huge time frame between when it's done, when it's finished editing, and when it actually goes to the first issue actually hits the printer. About a year usually. Okay, so about a year um, or less. Actually, sometimes you'll also yeah, be yeah. stipulated in your contract. Yeah, but I'm in saying e right. that could be a, as little <clears throat> as four to five months in ebook. Right. Yeah, so functionally, functionally, it's 35, day, 35 years from the date of creation. Um, in a lot of cases, that ends up being the date of publication. And in the music sphere, this is actually a big deal because most of the Beatles compositions are coming up for rights reclamation. Um, again. Again. Um, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of rock songs that are undergoing this kind of thing, so. Okay, so gray area. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, but pr functionally, it's from the day you finish writing it. One of the other things people come to see me about all the time is uh, is royalties, is, is your royalty provision, because your royalty provision probably starts out with, you're going to get a nice big royalty on these books that we're going to sell for you, but it's going to say something like, it kicks in after a thousand copies, or it's going to say something like, you know, it's on the market price, and we reduce your royalty on anything that's below what we decide that the top price ought to be. And 
the publisher sets the price. And if he decides it's going to be sold for less than that, you don't get the royalties. And if he decides it's going to be sold, sold for you know a punch rate, you, you don't get any royalties. And there's there's ways to um, really limit what you get, even though the number might look good on the front. So make sure you understand not just what that top line royalty says, but all the other parts of that paragraph that say what you get paid on every other price point, because every other price point is a lot more common. Also and understand that if you're given an advance on your book, that what mm -hmm. that means is that you don't see a penny until that advance is earned back, sorry, um, earned back in royalties. So if you know, you're given a $25,000 advance, you may never see another penny on your book. It all depends on how many copies you're selling. Also, you might want to check into the automatic renewal clause. Oh, some yeah, contracts will actually have, um, uh, after two to three years, your book is automatic re automatically renewed, unless in writing 60 days before, 90 days before, you uh, send a request into your publishing house. Keep an eye on those dates, because if you do <coughs> want to put on something that, it can be 59 days. That one day gives them the right to actually keep that for another two years or the length mm -hmm. of the contract. Now, mm -hmm. you can, because at the end of the contract, there's still a human being there. So what I would ask you guys, do you feel comfortable negotiating with your publisher if it's a sticking point? And then how do you go about doing that? From That's both? what I was about to talk about. Was, um, don't be afraid to negotiate. It might be your first contract, but if there is something in it that you are not happy with, that seems unfair, seems ridiculous, and seems like it's giving the publisher all the power, don't be afraid to negotiate. And if they're not willing to negotiate on a point, Fuck. find another publisher. Fuck them. Yep. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's a legal term. <laughs> Unless you're asking for something like a castle with a moat. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, normal sure stuff. I don't know how, if any of you have done this before, but pretty much with the exception of that first contract that just did, we were missing some things. Anytime I've signed a contract with a publisher, I have hired a lawyer to go over it. It's been like two or three hundred dollars because. <laughs> if, okay, why is that funny? It just. And, but and, look, here's the reality of that he spent two to three hundred dollars to have somebody go over a contract. And I can tell you if there's something wrong with the contract and you really don't want to sign it, and then you can find another publisher, fuck them, or you can go ahead and negotiate out the term if they want to be, be reasonable, and you end up with a contract that works. Or you can save that two to $300, and you can come to me, and it's going to cost you twenty to $30,000 if I can do anything, which I probably can't because you signed a shitty contract. And it's, the only thing you're going to do is pay me a couple hundred dollars to sit with you and say, this is a shitty contract and you never should have signed this. It's, uh, it's also worth noting, so if you live in a major metropolitan area, there are usually uh, pro bono arts lawyers associations that can help you with this kind of thing. Um, you know, deals like, uh, I know New York has one, Chicago has a very big one. Um, they'll cut across everything from visual artists. There's one in Atlanta as well. Georgia Lawyers for the Arts. All right then. Um, I'm from DC, so I don't know these things. Um, <laughs> Nothing's free in there DC. There are no arts in DC. Um, <laughs> we have zero art. Um, no, we do, it's all hanging in a museum. But uh, no, it's, it's, you know, there is a very high chance just, you know, go online, look it up, call your state bar association. There's in, I, I would be shocked if there is any kind of like city in like major city in this country that doesn't have some kind of pro bono legal assistance available to authors and to artists. So definitely except get DC, someone to look at it. Apparently, <laughs> yeah. Except well, yes. Right. So one of the and things I was actually minute. pointing out earlier was Sasha, what? Wait a minute. Go ahead. If you want to actually understand if a contract is good or bad before you take it to a lawyer, research. There are so many places online that help break down legalese into layman's terms so you can understand what you're getting into. That way you can look over this and go, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right, and then you can contract some help that you actually need. Here, let me give you a clue. Did the publisher give it to you? It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> look, I mean, the reality is, I, I, I'm, not saying, here. I, I'm not saying you shouldn't sign it. I'm not saying that ultimately it won't be something that you can make a good deal out of. I'm not saying that the business decision isn't right to make a bad deal sometimes. But you need to understand that the publisher contract is protecting the publisher. They're there to make sure that everything they want is in writing. 
they didn't really look to see what you wanted and make sure it was in there before they gave you that contract. It's not a negotiated deal. It's a, not here's my contract. No. Yeah. So a, 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 as the first shot, none of these are going to be good for you. Is a good deal? Do you get a good royalty? Do you get your book out there? There's pluses. You might decide to take the deal, but it's never going to be your deal if someone else gave you that contract. Unless you either, and this is the point I want to bring up because I'm, I'm not sure about you guys. Have any of you ever signed a contract and did it because of the career move? Yeah. I have not. I have mm -hmm. So for those who did sign it because of the career move, why? The rest of you, why not? Except when I gave you a book. You've turned to me. You oh, said I do all these things with me. I've never had a need to. Um, the first story I submitted to the first publisher I submitted to was accepted and so just I mean no I mean I, that's not usual so please don't take that to mean anything uh, I spent a lot a lot a lot of years writing fanfic and learning how to put things together in a way that read well you know so um, it's it's not usual that your first work is accepted by the first publisher you choose. I chose my publisher because it was a publisher that published the things that I was reading and enjoying, and their contract was, um, well, you know. Yeah. Who, Tolkien? Right? Yes. The contract is very straightforward. Yeah. Um, I, I'm from a family of lawyers, so I'm somewhat conversant with legalese. <laughs> so. I'm sorry. Yeah, I've, I've just never. <laughs> I said I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. We were both lucky that our, our first works are published with a company that's very fair and upfront Yeah, I mean, I, I read through the contract with the fine tooth comb and I didn't see anything about it that was of concern to me. Um, there were no red flags for me at all. So I, I never had to sign a contract as a career move. Okay. By the same token, there's a publisher <laughs> yes, let's do cover that bullshit wait, real quick. Wait, 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 before we go this, <laughs> I did sign a contract because another author who had a very big readership wanted to do a book with me, and I wanted her readership, but it was a throwaway story I really didn't care about. So I got together, I wrote this story, the contract, I really didn't care about it at all. It was a really good contract, but... By putting my name out there with her, I managed to snag about maybe three fourths of her readership and brought them over to my side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and that that's was a career fair enough. Move and that's career. why I signed the contract at Red Sage because, uh, with the exception of Cage, uh, in in the romance publishing industry, these are my peers, and in my case, Red Sage gave me street cred. I think that came out quite the way he meant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't write romance. No. <laughs> 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 With the I exception of Cage, everybody else here is my peer. Cage is a thing you guys don't have, I presume. All writers are peers, regardless of genre. Not my point. <laughs> I am a minority in romance. Yes, sir. yes, you are. I have no problem with that, but signing the contract, because again, it they wanted, they have rights that aren't even invented yet. They own that shit. Because I needed that street cred five, ten years ago. I signed it. So I actually, I do want to offer up one thing. Um, so I've, I've seen this going around a lot. Um, I talk to a lot of comic book artists um, and authors. So it's a, slight, it's a different publishing market. But there are two things that come up at least in those contracts that are usually red flags. Um, and you guys can let me know if this, if this is true for um, like traditional sort of book publishing. One is um, rights reversion. When, when you get your rights back, there tend to be two circumstances. Uh, one of them is the out-of-print clause, and one of them is um, uh, bankruptcy. Now, the out-of-print clause, you have to be careful because if anyone here has followed the career of Alan Moore, um, he got, yeah, this was, this was what turned him out of the industry almost permanently, um, was because essentially Watchmen for a long time, to avoid having the rights revert to him, they printed maybe 10 copies a year for something like a decade. Um, and that prevented it from going out of print. And so he didn't get the rights back. So that's one thing to be to be aware of. So a lot of times you can you can negotiate those clauses such that the out of print constitutes anything under a certain amount. So if you say, if you're printing less than 100 of them in a year, I get the rights back. So that's one thing. Let's, the other, go ahead. Uh, the other thing was the bankruptcy shuffle. Um, in the event of bankruptcy, 
you know, you get your rights back. The problem is when a company is going into bankruptcy, the first thing they're going to do is sell off the assets to another company, and those assets include the rights to your book. So because they will no longer be holding the rights to your book, when they file bankruptcy, you're not going to get them back. So don't ever just rely on a bankruptcy clause. One other clause that I like to see in a contract before I sign it is um, to make sure that unless they have X amount of time to publish the book, so they can't sit on it for... 10,000 years. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. That once, you know, they have a year, say, to publish your mm -hmm. book, and if not, then your rights revert back to you. What I want to know from you guys, what are some things you want to see in a contract? Money. Money. <laughs> Lots of money. Lots of money. No, I was going to say... How many writers are here, uh, professional or um, novice? Inspiring? Aspiring, yeah. Aspiring. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> so, what are the, what do you want to see in a contract? Fifty percent royalties. Of money. Fifty percent royalties. Well, you can negotiate that if your name is big. Because yes, at some publishing houses, I do get fifty percent on ebook um, e and print royalties. But you want to actually, I don't know how it is lately, but. When I first got um, I submitted, actually got published by accident, which was a long story. I'm not going to go into there. But um, the contract automatically was 45% royalties, and I thought that was good. And then later on, I found out that the base is like 35 to 25 for some publishing houses. So you want to make sure that all, for all your investments you're going to put into this, that the percentage of royalties you receive is going to be something that you can be satisfied with. And that you're actually going to receive them. Yeah, yeah. 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 you're actually receiving them. And I mean, and now, uh, now that POD is so popular, print on demand. Mm. Um, when I was first starting, my publishers were doing their own print versions of my books. So my royalty percentage on print books was something like seven or eight uh, percent. But now with the POD, it's much significantly higher on print books. So that's something to keep an eye on as well. Would you mind addressing what uh, we, hey, we got the cube coming. <laughs> talk to the box. It's, the it's like the conch. You have to have Would it. you please talk, talk the... about... Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to so, do that. Just, no, Speak just louder. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Speak anyway. into the box. Um, so whenever you say that you were making 7 to 8% or so, um, what exactly is the dollar amount of the books being sold in both print version and electronic version, etc.? That way there's a bit more basis of numbers okay. per unit. When I was first uh, published, I was receiving, I think, 33% royalties on ebook versions. I was getting 7 to 8%, I don't remember which it was, on print versions. Uh, the ebook would sell at, depending on length, I mean, I mostly write novel length stuff, so at the time it was about 599, I wanna say. Uh, so I would get 33% of that. Um, the print books were approximately 12.99, and I would get 8% of that, or 7%. So it's a significant difference. You wouldn't get 8% of the 12.99. You'd get 8% of <coughs> what's left the, after they took their cut. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. No, and it varies from of the sale price. And it can vary from publishing house to publishing house. Yeah, it absolutely does. Yeah. There is no standard as far as uh, percentages with regards to royalties. That's spe specific to the publisher in question. And I think there's a definite difference between small publishing houses, small publishing houses and um, New York publishing, especially when it comes to print books. Because I know print, we get the percentage off the top. It's off the cover price. Whereas in New York, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's off after they take their... Yeah, they make sure that they get their share. verses in the contract. There was something, too, with um, with royalties, or at least it was explained to me this was years back, where if if your book happens to be sold in stores or Amazon, if you do book signings or whatnot, the way it was explained to me before is that, um, like in Barnes & Noble, uh, Barnes & Noble, if they bought copies and sold them, they would have six months to give that money back to the distributor. Distributor has six months to get that money back to your publisher, so you could be waiting up to a year to see any of that money. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have to negotiate that and take a look. But you also need to check out the pricing system for the publishing houses that you get, because 
some of them have a very shoddy business model. Sometimes they will sell an ebook, well, a print book for $17.99, and then they'll turn around and sell the ebook for $12.99. Which is bullshit. Which it, it, but it's fucking bullshit. It is, but it's quite popular. A lot of publishing houses do that. And then too, you have to take into account third party, uh, um, third party, third party outlets, because you might get uh, X amount from directly from if you sell from your publisher's website, and another one for an Amazon. But then you have Kobo and Kindle and some other outlets that will also sell your book the third party way. So they all have to get yeah, their cut before right. the money comes back to you. So you have to make sure you keep a track of what your sales are that month so you can balance out to be sure that nobody is shorting you on the account. And that is important. I learned the hard way. Keep track of your book sales because any decent publishing house will send you monthly book, um, uh, book sales figures even if you don't get a check monthly. And that is to protect them and to protect you. Because if they mess up in the W-2s and their books say one thing and you have no proof to back that up, the IRS is going to come after you. So you need to keep a log and keep a record of everything and yeah. hold on to it. And third-party vendors are kind of... Um, Shifty. I, I don't want to say a law unto themselves because clearly the law is a law, but um, yeah, right. <laughs> Hush. Law. Don't interrupt me when I'm speaking. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. Um, the the thing with third party vendors is that they get a cut automatically off the top of your sales. So if your book is on, um, let's say, ARE, all romance ebooks. Uh, they get, I think, a 25% cut of the cover price of your that book. That much? Yeah. Yes. yeah. The I remainder mean, okay of that this, goes That's to awesome. your yeah. publisher, and then you get whatever your royalty percentage is from what's left after the third party vendor has gotten paid. So, for example, Amazon takes out of a dollar on a book, Amazon takes 25 cents, your publisher gets, 30, your publisher gets 70 cents, whatever the math is there. And then I and get, then get whatever my percentage is. Okay. You know, so it's, um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and bullshit. And one thing to remember about that, too, is, I mean, there, there's been a mention of this. Again, this comes up all the time. Um, the before and after cost. Because the problem is, when I start taking my costs away, I can make the cost of a product very easily, you know, very, very, very easy math to make the cost of a product be more than the product. And then there's no royalty, or the royalties on a very, uh, very small amount. Yeah, that's the other so. thing to watch for in a contract is whether your royalties are on net or gross. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. What's it the preferred? What's the preferred huge method? Huge difference. What's the preferred wanting out of that? Gross. 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 You're gonna get you're gonna yeah. You, yeah. You Next want you gross. You try to catch what's flying away. <laughs> Well, but you, you, you want gross, but you get net, and then your job is to go through and make sure that that net is reasonable. And you do, you know, you've got to take, you've got to take control of making sure that those accountings are right. You've got to, you've got to ask to see the books. You've got to make sure that they're not charging an arm and a leg for things that shouldn't be too high. Which um, something else? Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did, oh no, I was going to talk about publishing houses who don't actually pay their royalties on time. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess we have to go here now, don't we? Oh. Yes. We we have to still be well, fuck it, whatever. Make it short. I'm going to try to make this short. There's a publishing house one of my which is so sad to me cuz one of the first publishing houses I started with was Alora's Cave. Run from them. Fucking stay very far from them. Very, very far away. This is the kiss of death. Why? Because I hate to say this, but insane women with menopause running a publishing house is not good. And I can badmouth them because I got my rights back. But I'm gonna say that that depends on the insane woman with menopause. <laughs> you no, know, there's insane. Yeah, hashtag not all insane women with menopause. Insane women I mean, with menopause who are. I mean, schizophrenic, insane, hearing voices, and you know, you're not. J Jade's, Jade's, Jade's hearing voices now. Allegedly, because we have lawyers. Yeah, she's been hearing voices for years. Okay, so I no, this is nothing new. I have plenty to say, not in this panel. And the but, voices yeah. are saying, "Don't pay your royalties. You can just hold on <laughs> to that money for later." No. And they were a ten million dollar a year company. Seriously, Easily. I can't tell you Tell's how many. Please. I cannot tell you how many e-publishers have imploded. 
which unfortunately it looks like that's the way that EC is going. Three. Okay. They needed to employ uh, to implode a long time ago. Yeah, we're, they just they just went under two. Yeah, we're talking now, and just to highlight some of the stupidity. Somebody at the head of this decided that we're going to pay you know our our authors four times a month, but we're only going to pay them one month salary every four months instead of, you know, the three that you would expect to get paid for that. This is the type of insanity we are talking about. Records that aren't kept right, um, the books that don't match up, the W-2s that they send you has actually more than what they actually paid you. Things like this are, it's devastating to an author, especially a new author who's putting their trust in a publishing house. You would like to think of your publishing house as a family. You get along with some people, you get adult with some, but you would like to have a little bit of trust in that. And when a new writer starts off and gets that much betrayal, it devastates them and it, for the rest of their career, their writing career, it's going to overshadow what they do and what they feel and what they think. And they'll quit and become lawyers. Well, actually, the, the cause of this is do not pick with lawyers because the whole EC lawsuit, well, one of the few, well, one of the many EC lawsuits, the one that's imploding now, is that there is a blog group called Dear Author. And when authors were reporting that they were not getting paid royalties, Dear Author did what a blog what should do, and they took that and they put that information out there for the public. EC says, it's defamation of character and it's all lies. And then the authors are like, oh, and no, then, it, then it went on a witch hunt against the authors. So now authors are afraid to come out. But then some authors stood up and they actually have proof. So they decide they were going to sue. Dear author, who is owned by lawyers, decided to counter sue. Now, I'm going to leave it at this. The hashtag is, uh, was it hashtag? Not chilled. Not chilled. Not chilled, yeah. Hashtag not chilled. <laughs> Take, check, go there and you can see the whole sordid story. But what we're talking about now is a lot of lawsuits. Uh, how many discovery came up and they had maybe one thing to actually submit to the judge, which is basically, we paid them one time and it was over 250. Yeah. EC submitted four things for discovery. Dear Author submitted 52. Oh. If it was a numbers game, Dear Author would win. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. You just honestly, just don't fuck your authors over. That's all there is to it. Don't fuck them over. Oh, what? predators, editors. No. Yeah. Pierce Anthony's. Pier oh, Pierce Anthony's video. better. Yeah, but yeah. Predators and Editors is also a good place to start. Pierce Anthony Group is better. They give you the lowdown on agents, on publishing houses, and they get them not from propaganda, but from the authors themselves, because they tend to be honest. Talk to the authors. These authors, if they're not sipping the Kool-Aid from their publishing house, will generally come out and tell you what's going on. Yeah, I would, I would ask any one of the authors up here, questions about a publishing house. If I wanted to write for Torque Ray or Dream Spinner, um, that's you too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would ask about those guys. And also, in my opinion, and I have violated the rule because it didn't work out. It worked out for me well, very well, actually. But I tend to go with a publisher that has been around for five years or more. Yeah. Because they've been around. They've got a track record. Obviously, the contracts, they still might be in the house's favor. I don't have to care so much because I'm not having to worry about that so much. But that doesn't always hold true. Laura's right. Cave is the oldest ebook. Mm -mm. Second, old, no. second, no. oldest. Second, second oldest. oldest. Second oldest. Second oldest. No, actually, no, after Sizzler. no, after Sizzler editions, yeah. the late David Dyer started that. Uh, they have yeah. been around forever. Is my point. Yeah. So they kind of trump your five-year rule. Yeah. But I know. it's true. But that's yeah. when you just publishers pop up like mushrooms. I mean, they're up. Because you end up with a lot of authors who think they want to get into publishing, and when they start, when they start, I'll be honest. My boss at Arden is really good at being a businesswoman, but she can't. She's not geared towards the artist connectivity side of the industry, and you have to allow for that to happen. Because, well, quite frankly, a lot of us are kind of fucked up, and a lot of us are we do different things in different ways that don't make sense to your average people. I mean, how many of you are night owls who write at night? Yeah, see? And then Karen, you've been writing at night for as long as I've known you, I think, yeah? And you too, Burke, yeah, so. 
but you have to have that balance. Um, we got about uh, half hour. Wait. Hi, uh, just about. Y'all want to do Q and A from the audience? Yeah. yeah. I actually, can I start? I have a question oh, for the uh, authors yeah, here. You did, yeah, you did, yeah. Um, so, just some background. So, when we deal with uh, like intellectual property issues at, at my organization, um, one of the things we deal with a lot is Amazon, um, because. <laughs> If they've found a way to piss authors off, if it exists, they've probably found it or they're working on it. Um, and so one of the things that, like, coming from, from a lawyer's perspective, if we look at Amazon, um, you know, there's this whole move towards self-publishing. They allow um, sort of self-publishing on the Kindle store now. Uh, you know, from, from a legal perspective, there's a lot of concern about, well, if you publish yourself through the Kindle store, they release it in Kindle format, which can then only be bought through Amazon and read on Amazon devices or software from here into eternity. So there's this kind of, you know, this this like long yeah. tail of, it's, it basically becomes this like big antitrust thing. I wanted to know if any of you have ever gone that route, what your experiences with, with Amazon and especially like in the Kindle side of things have been like, like what do those deals look like? Are you I honestly, fans, not fans? I honestly have no problem because I pretty much run my own game, but others may have different opinions. And also, I actually wanted to add, because now I know they're moving to the uh, pay-per-page view uh, model, and Tom, what you're... All right. That's not I that bad some of these thing. Reactions. Actually, I'm an Amazon It's, it's not that bad a thing. It means you're going to get a lot of shitty-ass authors going away because they don't... They're, the authors because are trying to follow them. Don't get strong enough. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But right now, I'm in Amazon jail with about nine books and probably more because of the book covers. See, Amazon, unfortunately, right now is, is kind of setting the industry standard for things, including book covers. So um, any hint of nudity at all, and I know some of them, it's anything that, that represents bondage, things like that male or female, they don't want it. And they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, about two years ago, there was a shakeup because Kobu and I love Kobu dearly, but they were not policing what they were doing. And that was the advent when self-publishing really started getting big of the daddy rape porn I and the three. incest. Yeah, about three bullshit. years. Yeah, but when they did, they overreacted because it's their fault anyway for actually not going and seeing where these authors were loading this stuff up or giving them a schematic to follow. But you would hear, um, you would, they targeted like, a lot of the LGBT authors. Hold up. Before then, it started with a, a, a child looked for daddy's, um, uh, something involving daddy, and got daddy raped me. Full cover, NC-17, and it's like, <sighs> wow. So they overreacted. Anything that even hinted at that was pulled down. Unfortunately, Amazon followed behind them. And what they did was books that actually had rape in the title, like Rape Survival or Therapy for People Who Have Been Raped, everything was pulled down. And this is like the second time they've done this. The first time they blinked it on a computer glitch. Well this aware. time it was overreacting because Kobo freaked out and overreacted. They apologized and slowly started putting things back up again, but then they went buck wild on the covers. So if you had a cover, the woman can be perfectly clothed, but her hands are above her head and, and, and tied. No, that's bondage. You can't do that. And male nipples are no longer allowed to show. Bullshit. <laughs> Please, why do you think I'm in Amazon jail right now? And when they put you in Amazon jail, you have to have the direct link to get to that book. So even if you go under my um, Amazon author page or you oh, hunt for me, that way? yes, yeah. you're not going to be there. They need a direct not find that book, you have to have a direct Yep, so be weary of that because Amazon is monopoly. Quite often they do that almost arbitrarily. It just seems like one day you're searchable and the next day you're not. Yep. And it's, it's, it's got to do in part with, I guess, an attempt at moralization and the problem is, is I'm not yeah. sure that's something you should do. I could tell you an, an example, give you an example of the Amazon mindset. Um, so. Was it two years ago? I don't know. A year and a half last year. Last year, I think, maybe. Um, I wrote a story on a dare, which I do quite often. <laughs> and I actually wrote this one under a different pseudonym because I wanted to see if it was going to get pulled. I wrote T Rex Fisting Party by R. Quarry. I have heard of this. It's still up there. And it still sells. But and the, T-Rex and I pulled my hair. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> little tiny arms. <laughs> but I realized what the difference was. The difference is it can't ever happen. 
that's Amazon's mindset. Because it's T-Rexes and humans, <laughs> it can't ever really happen. So it's total fantasy. And well, they're okay with that. Fuck's yeah, sakes. They, the they, T-Rex, but the T-Rex or gang bang by the Velociraptor. <laughs> but, but they let. There's a bunch by Chuck Tingle, I think. He writes a bunch of them. <laughs> but they let the. the, the it's like the millionaire dinosaur took me. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I screwed the billionaire plane. <laughs> billionaire airplane. Yeah, the billionaire airplane. That was my favorite. It's not the right alcohol for me to have that. <laughs> my point is that it's it's that's that's their kind of mindset that you know it's okay to have these books out and searchable because they can't ever happen, but to have you know something with rape in the title which could actually happen yeah. that's they pull them they're like See, afraid he, here's the thing the, 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 those are all really good points that I, I really do hate to undercut them but i will kick myself if i don't say this <laughs> don't you hate it when people overreact to daddy rape porn <laughs> I will pay to see you kick yourself. <laughs> she will. So I, wanna... I have a shiny new nickel just for you. <laughs> I shiny new nipples aren't allowed on one... Amazon. <laughs> Did you say shiny nipples? <laughs> she said nickel. nickel. Oh. But what I said shiny nipples. nipples. I want to bring up a point that uh, you wanted to mention earlier. Uh, well, yeah. Go, well, go for it. Ask the question. <laughs> I didn't ask a question, I was just saying. Well, we need to cover it anyway. Oh, I was going to say, when you asked about terms you don't want to see in a contract or red flags. Oh, yeah. Apparently, this thing you just talking into the mic. I am talking into the mic. Okay, anyway, things you didn't want to see in a contract. Rights of first refusal. You can see them, but you want to be careful about how they're worded. Because based on how they're worded, the publisher could, like you said with your name, pretty much have you for the rest of your writing career. Right. Now, they could have your entire series, your entire world, all your characters, or just everything you write from that point forward, you have to send it to them first. And they have 60 days to decide if they want it, and if they decide they want it, but you don't want to give it to them, they didn't have 90 days to negotiate with you, which means they're gonna sit on it for 90 days and whether you keep saying no, 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 no matter what. I'll give you an example of that. Dara Mike. Joy. Mike. Oh. Dara Joy was a really prolific writer. She wrote some amazing things back in the late 90s. But because of a clause in her contract with Dorchester, it was to the it, it was really weird things. She got a, a series of books published at another publisher, but used the name from the wizard in one of the other books. And that gave them right to sue her and take all the books from the second one. So she basically disappeared and she had a really promising career. So you really have to be careful about those clauses in that right of refusal. Ask them to define it clearly. Let's do Q&A with you guys. How about that? We've got, we've got the cube out in the wild. Somebody ask me something, please. <laughs> I'll keep talking, so. Because I love to babble. Questions? Q, Q, Q I'm a Sagittarius. We need the Q part of the Q&A. A lot of A's. <laughs> All right. Okay. Lawyer I've, makeup I've got a question for you guys. Um, What's up? How do you feel about the um, possibility of the, the orphan uh, works, copyright laws that possibly might be taking effect, and how does it affect authors? Cool. So... Uh, <laughs> Yay! Um, I get to be relevant for a second. Um, so, so the orphan works thing. For those of you who haven't been following this, um, and you know, don't get paid to do it like I do. Um, basically, the Library of Congress finally, after many years, has released a report regarding orphan works. Orphan works are those works where, if you like, say I wanted to uh, use a copy of an orphan work, I'm relatively certain that it's still under copyright but I can't find the author. I can't find the person I need to pay. Uh, so that's an orphan work, basically. We don't know if it's in the public domain. We're not entirely sure if it like belongs to someone. A lot of times it's either an author who went under a pseudonym and didn't like keep decent records or their publishing house has gone under or they have passed, or they have passed away and they didn't explicitly write in their will who gets the copyright to their works, like among their estate. You know, there's, there's a million different categories that orphan works can fall into. Um, so the Register of Copyright finally released this report. Um, they've got some good points and some bad points. There's a lot of recommendations they made in there. One of them is this idea that you have to perform an exhaustive search first, um, which, you know, the question is what constitutes an exhaustive search? 
um, you know, if you're, if I am a teacher and I want to use this stuff for a classroom project and I am theoretically supposed to find who I need to pay to use this excerpt of this work, you know, I'm not going to have the resources that Microsoft would if they want to use this work in an ad campaign. Um, and so there's, you know, I haven't had a chance actually to read it in depth. Um, one of my, strangely enough, my office mate is the one who deals with that. Um, but it's got some good stuff. It's got some not so great stuff. Uh, right now, I mean, no, what no one wants to see is uh, is going back to a registration-based system because that's a nightmare. Um, right. Both in terms of the fact that the Copyright Office is still working, I think, on Windows 98. Um, <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. I think they actually are. Uh, really? Stable. <laughs> Because the I library. have seven, and they keep telling me that I can. It's the empty core. The Library of Congress. This is a big deal because the Librarian of Congress oh. is retiring, and they are trying oh. to find a new one. This Librarian of Congress has been a nightmare. Yeah, he, um, was, a he is. He was a history professor. He's not a librarian. He's not there a technologist. No he's not an author. Seven is the best. Uh, and he really has. They haven't updated the library. The Library of Congress IT system since he got there about 20 years ago. So. Who's still running on DOS? <laughs> Basically, yes. Um, so yeah, so there's a big debate about who they're going to get to replace him if they want someone who's actually a librarian, which would be great, um, who actually knows what they're talking about. So yeah, so that's that's the Orphan Works problem. Um, it's it's kind of a hit or miss game right now. Um, it's nice that they finally actually did a report about it and like acknowledged that this is an issue for a lot of end consumers. And again, I come from the end consumer perspective. Like, I come from a reader's uh, angle on this, so that's. We're still looking at it, but yeah, there'll be a lot of back and forth about that in like the coming years, I think. I have a box. Look, I have a box. I can talk into the box. We write erotica. Be careful with that. Do 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 be careful with that because yeah, I've always wanted to be a character in somebody else's story instead of my own. I'm okay with that. Sweet. (laughs) What up, kid? The question is, um, you're a writer or you're an aspiring writer and you're shopping around for a publisher. Talk to me about the good and bad points of being published by someone you know, someone you're friends with. Ooh. Talk to me about oh the my. good and bad points of that. <laughs> um, it has both good and bad points, honestly. I mean, your friend is more likely to accept your manuscript, but your friend is also more likely to assume that you're going to be okay with whatever contact contract they throw at you and if you're not that can cause problems i have friends who are publishers oh i have friends who are publishers but they're business people first you have to look at that friend and see if they have the ability to separate private life from business life if they can't do that do not go with that person my friends thankfully do have that ability because if I do something that's wrong they're going to call me on it and they even got me when I was early um, writing with Char- Changeling Press I know the owners I wrote with them at EC before they broke off and she actually sipped, slipped into a contract that I automatically signed that she owned my my soul Your, my immortal soul she put that in there and that's what I get for not reading the contract and she pointed it out and pointed it out to me so if you have a friend who's good at business and wants to keep a business going and is not going to rely too much on that friendship, that's great. But if you have somebody who blurs the lines between business and friendship, you might not want to go with that. And on that same note, get it in writing. Yeah. Always get it in writing. I, I will tell you, having gone, having gone through 1L contracts in law school, the entire 1L contracts textbook is people who didn't get it in writing. I, so oh, do but not it, end it up does in make a law school. It, it does make a difference like who you're talking to. Because I, I know Kiernan, for example, um, Kiernan will not write for me at Silver Editions anymore. And that's fine. We're still friends today. You know, ain't no problem. But she's got calls for submissions. What did you have me do? You have me do the um, uh, Fifty Shades of Shade. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because because honestly, what it boils down to, on some regards, is I don't mind owing a favor to some folks because in the future they'll owe me a favor. Well, and, and the these other people thing, are still at books. The other thing um, about publishing with a publisher who happens to be a friend of yours is when you became friends. I mean, if you were friends before you submitted something to them, you could be in for a world of hurt. If you've submitted to them, they've accepted your manuscript, you've signed numerous contracts with them, and then you became friends, that's a whole other story. Good point. Yeah, here, let me give you the flip side of that position, though. (laughs) Because here's the reality. I'm a litigator, and people don't come to me until things have gone wrong. So 100% of the contracts I've seen have gotten fucked up. 
and somebody's pissed off at somebody. And it's one thing to be pissed off at somebody on the other side of an email chain who you don't really know and all you really want is your royalties and another thing to be pissed off at your best friend for 15 years. So you always have to consider that this deal could go great. This deal could go wonderful and no one has any problems with anybody and everybody's happy and everybody makes money. Or the deal could go south. And if the deal goes south, what's going to happen? Because when, you, when you're making deals with people, not only are you going to end up having to you know, have this, this, this heartburn with your friend, but if you're going to turn around and, and have to sue your friend, are you going to want to sue your friend? Or are you going to be less likely to sue for your royalties? Because now I don't want to sue my friend. So, or are you going to be more vicious when suing your former friend? Right. And it, does, it, it, it all comes down to what do you want out of your career? Because every single thing you, every single move you make has obviously an impact. No pressure. <laughs> yes. Rocket. Oh, uh, so on, on the uh, orphan, right, right there. When the report came out, one thing that I, I see a lot of confusion out there on is that the the register talked both about orphan works and mass digitization. Mm -hmm. And so there's some <laughs> right, some other that are uh, they confuse. I think it's all, all. Oh my God, everything's gonna. And it's not quite that, you know, it's not quite that bad because they're confusing those two bits. And the mass digitization is just sort of a pipe dream of the register of, of, of <laughs> academics, not anything that's probably going to happen. Mm. Right. There's never been any proposed legislation on that. Right. The, um, and the way they are, it, it's, we say we don't want the registration system, right? Mm. But all it does is affect the remedies. And if right. you want good remedies to start with, you have to have registered anyway. So... It, it's really not a, it, as huge a shift, I think, as right. um, some people are making it out potentially to be. And it's never passed, I think, even one house. So, right. Yeah. So the the background and so mass digitization again for those of you who aren't paid to spend eight hours a day thinking about this, um, usually sideways, um, is so basically Google Books uh, was back in 2009, I think, was when this, the first attempt at a settlement came down on Google Books. And that was, I mean, that was crazy. That was crazy times to be following that. Um, essentially, what Google Books did was they went to uh, University of Michigan Library and a couple others, and they said, give us your stash, and we will scan and digitize and do optical character recognition on everything in your library. Uh, and, you know, this becomes a problem when you have books which are under contract where you know the publishing house has the right to the ebook format which Google is now creating uh, and there was a lot of you know this went back and forth and they did a million different things about like oh well you know we'll give you some money and well we're only going to use this we're only going to release the full digitized archive to the University of Michigan so we're not giving them anything they don't already have and this just went like crazy this this was total crazy times for a while um they had a settlement the court rejected it because i had a most favored nation clause in it and blah 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 so um basically the mass digitization is this idea that that google was very into and i'm pretty sure they have either toned it down or, or mostly put the brakes on it by now of digitizing and making searchable almost every written work like in human history um, to make like a big e-library. Um, orphan works are kind of a different thing, but orphan works did come into the digitization because they would go, you know, well, we don't we don't know, you know, we're running, we're running, scanning millions and millions of books. We're not going to know who to pay for all of them. And so there was some stuff in the settlement about like, well, how do we structure that? And so it, it got a little nuts. So that's where that, that's what the background on that is. They still have Google Books, but mm -hmm. I think it's more like run like an Amazon now. Yeah, it's, than, I don't think they're actively yeah, they going out and scanning in the kind of volume that they were. Yeah. Is yes. there any kind of protection um, for writers from somebody coming in? Is this through the publisher or the writers themselves? Insurance you have to carry from somebody coming in and saying, oh my God, I wrote that. You stole that from me. You know, and that kind of can they prove it? Yeah, if you can't but, prove it, but that's somebody a law, else has that's a legal it, thing screwed. where you have to bring in lawyers, right? And that's money. Well, yeah, sorry, but, but I mean, no, that, that's, that's, no, that's, right. that is my job. Um, yeah, we we like making ourselves necessary. That's, <laughs> that's, lawyers are really good at one thing, and that's interjecting ourselves so into somebody everything. Somebody publishes something under their name, mm -hmm. and somebody later comes along and says, "No, I wrote that." Don't they need to be able to prove that they wrote it prior to the data public? Right. Yeah. So what the. Uh, so basically, so copyright. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, and That's there's a question. three years of law school, and I might have a beginning of an answer for that. Um, 
So copyright attaches basically, so copyright is when you have it in a fixed medium. Like it has to be written down somewhere. It either has to be you know, electronic with pen and paper, it doesn't matter. Um, and then you have a copyright in a book. If somehow we managed, to, it's like a Borges story where he tries to rewrite Don Quixote, um, you know, from scratch. It's one of my favorite stories. Copyright lawyers love that story. Um, but essentially, like, if if I was to walk up to J.K. Rowling and be like, hey, I wrote Harry Potter three years before you did, I would then have to produce the manuscript of Harry Potter that I wrote three years before she did. Um, and I'd have to have some way of proving that that existed three years before hers. So that's where yeah. that would come in in a court of law. And prior to... Uh the Did you get that thing I sent you? widespread <laughs> advent of digital media, uh, you could actually send yourself in the U.S. mail a so, copy of your manuscript they, or your yeah. story, and the postmark would prove when you wrote it. Mm-hmm. That was a long time. Yeah, they just well, they no just wouldn't because the other box ago. have steam. But you can't prior it, to the advent it was, of it, it, the way things are. It was never but, that way. <laughs> No, it, 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 honestly, it's, it was it, 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 it was it was really never that people people did it, and it does give you some proof of when you created it. If you can go show me, have this thing that says it's it was created on this date. The problem is, I can steam that letter open, put a new thing in it, seal that letter back up again, and all that proves is you have an envelope with a thing in it. So it's not really the best proof. More importantly, you can't actually sue me because you can't you can't take someone to court unless the work is registered. So if someone says that you're infringing them or they're infringing you, you got to go to court to prove it. You can't get to the keys to the courthouse door unless you have a registration. So mailing it to yourself doesn't do anything. Put a $35 check in it and mail it to the copyright office instead. You can try. Sweet. It was just very recently that uh, they had somebody who was taking people's works and putting new covers on them and changing mm-hmm. the yeah, name of the that. character mm-hmm. on Amazon. So it's 9.30. Scott probably wants us to clear out here real quick. I'd like some final thoughts from you guys. Last words, final Me? thoughts. All right. Well, I'll bring us back full circle to the beginning. Remember your contract and remember your Tom Waits. The large print giveth and the small print taketh away. <laughs> <laughs> so, We're done here. so know what you're signing before you sign it. Yeah. Uh, consult a lawyer. And I'm, I'm actually not saying that because I, I don't consult clients, so I'm saying this for my brothers in arms. Um, consult, if, just read your contracts. Find a pro bono lawyer if you need one. Don't don't try to go it alone like a lot of people do, and that's where they make a mistake. Yeah. Research. Do a lot of research even before you submit to a publishing house. Talk to the authors. Check out the uh, the different inf- uh, format. And- websites that we've given you, like Piers Anthony, Predators and Editors, even check out the RWA if it's romance, or if not, they'll have something there, a society or a group there to actually support and give information in your genre. So research even before you start to send out, because if you're getting bad vibes from what other people are saying, it's best to kind of avoid that. And stay away from Alora's Cave. <laughs> and buy my Fuck books. Fuck those guys. Buy my books. I buy her books. Um, I'm not sure if I can actually add to that, really. Um, just make sure you, like they said, do your research. Make sure you read your contract. If you don't understand it, find someone who does. That's, that's all I can add to that. If Project. something in a contract seems like it is deliberately obfuscated and you don't understand the worst possible way that it could be interpreted... Be sure that the publisher will use the worst possible way for you that that clause can be interpreted. Get somebody else to look it over to make sure it says what you think it does, and then negotiate or walk away. Uh, As far as copyrights go, I've gotten into a lot of discussions with friends who are authors online who self-publish like one book a month, and they do not copyright their work at all. I copyright Don't even my short stories. Copyright your shit. Just so we're clear, copyright your shit. <laughs> just, just for the record, I have no idea who those people are. <laughs> okay, well, that was fun. <laughs> All right, real quick now. Who does And I need to hear you guys. You. Hand of applause for my homeboys up here. Woo! 
louder. And fellow panel members, let's have some applause for our lovely audience tonight. Yes. And, and lastly, for Sasha for hurting the cats. Yeah, that too. And lastly, mad respect to my boy Scott for doing this for us. Scott, the keeper of the big orange box. Thank you. Ooh, that Thank sounded you almost as filthy as I wanted it I to. Have some stuff up here if anybody